All right, continuing on the concept of faith, and I'll bet you better get this one right, okay? Because again, by grace you have been saved through faith, okay? If righteousness comes through the law, Christ died needlessly. By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, grounded ultimately in Scripture alone, okay? Again, the solas of the Reformation, this is one of the biggies, okay? So, but the point is, it's not just Protestant Reformation theology, arguably it's biblical, as we've gone through a, a, a number of the texts already. So to, to sort of finish our, our look at the doctrine of faith, what it means, what it doesn't mean, uh, roughly on page four or five, we looked at the source of faith. And for example, Philippians 1.29 is one of those texts that uh, says, yeah, God's the source of salvation, but God's also the source of faith. Philippians 1.29 says, to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for his sake, okay? So again, everybody wants to claim that first part of the verse, right? You know, it's granted for you to believe. It's gifted for you to believe in him, okay? But also the other gift of God is to suffer. I don't, I don't, like, I don't want to claim that promise, man. So much for name it and claim it, right? So you'd be very selective on that. So all that to say is we look at that. I've already mentioned the relationship of faith and works. And I, I, I looked at that idea, uh, faith without works is dead, James 2.26. Why? Because look, Matthew 7, a good tree bears good fruit. If you're born again, you have a new heart, you have the Holy Spirit guiding, leading, convicting you, you really have changed your mind, rejected things, Christ is your Savior, your Lord, all of that, you're going to act differently. That doesn't mean you're sinless, it just means you've got a new focus and you will simply act differently because why? Because you're a new creation in Christ. So now all that to say is move now uh, roughly on page six and seven. I list about 14 or 15 different kinds of faith. And that's why when someone says, I have faith, you're trying to examine someone's faith. The fact is, is that, look, we're, we're not judges in the sense that we don't know someone's ultimate salvation uh, for eternity. But guess what? If they're saying false doctrine and they don't even understand the gospel, you can make a proper judgment or assessment that they're not saved because they don't even understand the gospel. Uh, but what we don't do is be the, be the ultimate judge. Well, I think you have too much sin in your life, so therefore you must not be saved. Okay? Fact is, you know, Christians struggle. And uh, some people struggle with fleshly, visible sins. Some people struggle with more spiritual sins. Again, but the point is, is that salvation is based on faith alone and Christ alone. So again, yeah, you can be a fruit inspector, but not, you're not the ultimate judge. So that, that's pretty important. So that said, looking at the defective views of faith or incomplete views of faith, I just want to highlight a couple of these. I already mentioned objective faith, subjective faith, what saving faith is. But here's the stuff that is probably the most common that you're going to find in the church, okay? Because remember, our biggest enemies are false teachers in the church, the ones that occupy our pulpits, the ones who say they believe the gospel but really don't, and they're leading the church in another direction. This is how we've lost, I mean, every church, every movement, every seminary for the last 2,000 years is phony leaders who come in, they lie, they say they believe what we believe, and they don't really, and then little by little, they get the reins of power, start churning over the leadership, and eventually you don't recognize it as a church anymore. It's something else. So we always have to go and start the new building program, new churches, because we weren't faithful in the leadership. So again, feel free if something doesn't smell right in your church, your university, your seminary, ask what's going on. Okay, Because again, the history of God's people as well as the church is we always start out well, False teachers come in, false leaders, false administrators, and we're always starting over, little by little, time by time. So anyway, all that to say is back to saving faith. Again, you want to be a, an effective preacher, law gospel preaching. God demands holiness. You failed. You're guilty, corrupt, alienated, and you're going to be dead and, and separated from God forever. But God is offering you a way. Not only is the message that you need to know for salvation, but whether you believe you can lose your salvation or not, it's the means of grace by which the saints persevere, at least one of the main ones. We need to hear that all the time. 
because of the world, the flesh, and the devil are constantly taking us away from our focus on that essential truth. So that said, here's how saving faith can be corrupted, okay? Uh, Historical faith. What's historical faith that's not, not saving faith? Historical faith is the acceptance of data as true apart from any faith, okay, or trust or spiritual effect, which, by the way, this is probably the vast majorities of, you know, fake believers or the tares in the wheat field in our churches. They, they know, these are people who have been sitting there for 30, 40 years. They hear the material, they nod their heads, they say amen, but they really don't have a commitment to following Christ. The second they leave the building, they're still going their own way. So this is why, practically speaking, and I'll say this too, James 2.19 uh, says, you believe God is one, you do well. The demons believe that and tremble. Yeah, demons have more knowledge of God about Trinitarianism and all sorts of things than we have right now. Uh, the church militant, the live on earth right now. So, so again, it's not enough to know that this stuff is true. You have to repent and want to know God. So you have to commit to it. So again, historical faith is the kind that fits in the church really well. Because outwardly, people would seem to understand and assent that the stuff is true. But this is why you have to constantly, very important here, call for repentance and commitment. That's the difference between, and again, I want to get into in, in uh, module seven, we'll look at uh, pneumatology or the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, uh, ecclesiology, spiritual gifts, things like that. But ultimately, a prophetic gift isn't, I mean, that 1% or less of that in the scripture is predicting the future. The prophets called people to repentance. They told people they were in sin, said, you know what, you need to repent and come back to what God has already said. Come back to God and true holiness. And people don't like hearing that, that they're not good with God, so we have the hall of faith, right? Uh, all the prophets that were murdered, killed, tortured. So again, our ministry has to always be more than didactic. It always has to be more than preaching. For believers or unbelievers, there always has to be a call for repentance, confession, and faith. Because Christians, you know, I guess what? If you don't feel close to God, you know you're a believer, guess what? Repent, come back. Uh, again, you, you, you can, as a child, you can be alienated from your parents, even though they're still your parents, and you can be wandering off. Repent and come back and want a relationship with them. Repentance is constant in the Christian life. So again, we have to call people to do it, convict them of sin, law gospel preaching, call to repentance. You want to have a powerful ministry, stick with what the Bible says, okay? If you want to go off on all your interesting concepts that doesn't get anyone saved, okay, again, you'll have to answer for, to God for what ministry you do. I want to reach as many people for Christ as I can. So again, I'm going to stick to law gospel preaching on that. So all that said is you want to recognize tares in the wheat field, and you can make a really good case. Judas Iscariot was not saved. He was the ultimate tear in the wheat field. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He probably had knowledge of what was true, uh, you know, knowledge of the gospel, the truth of it, but he still had his own agenda. He was not committed to Christ. In fact, it's interesting in the Last Supper, think about this. Uh, go back and read that passage when Jesus says, one of you here is going to betray me, right? And then, right, the other 11 apostles turned to Judas and went, Judas, because it was so obvious, right? No, the point is, it wasn't obvious. The point is, they're like, well, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? So the point is, is you can be a perfect tear in the wheat field and just have an historical faith where you have knowledge and assent, but no trust. So again, make sure in your preaching and teaching, you're always calling for repentance and commitment uh, for believers, because you'll have unbelievers are there, you can have believers, you know, and, and so forth. But whether it's for sanctification or salvation, that, that's part of it. Deal with historical faith. Um, legal faith, the next one, uh, this is the idea of, this is accepting as true the contents of divine revelation apart from the gospel. So these are people who are the moralist, okay? 
These are the people who accept the law of God. They might accept natural law. They're trying to be a good person, but they really are rejecting, again, the fact that they have to admit that they're sinners, that they can't make satisfaction for themselves, and so on and so forth. That's what's called a legal faith. They trust that there's a moral law of God that they have to follow, but they reject Christ's provision for that. So again, but that what's that? That's Phariseeism, right? So that's the legal faith. So you can go through the rest of the uh, um, the rest of these type: uh, temporary faith, miraculous faith, actual faith, justifying faith, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, those are the the five or six types of faith that are the most important for us. Again. What we want to do is get people to saving faith. And ultimately, again, whether you think you can lose your salvation or not, the one who endures till the end will be saved. So you have to constantly teach the Bible clearly. The law gospel, again, you're a sinner. Again, you'll break the law all the time, but God has made a provision for you. That gets you saved. It helps you endure till the end. So be effective for Christ. And again, take that, you know, teach Bible and theology well, answer all the objections, and then call for commitment. And again, be faithful until God calls you home. Thanks.